aware of your presence. I don't think there's a better line than that. If you want to know a little bit more about that, Gene Luter brought a book this morning, or there was a book circulating in that class. It's by, written by a Catholic monk named Brother Lawrence. Brother Lawrence wrote a book called Practicing His Presence, or Practicing the Presence of God. Uh, that has so radically influenced my concept of what it means to know that God is there and to be aware of that. It's a great book, little book. It's a, it's a very short read, and if you wanted to get that book, I'm sure she would uh, show it to you and let you know where you can get it. And uh, I did have a copy of it in my library in my office, but I went to look for it a few moments ago, and it's gone. So I lent it out to somebody and uh, didn't come back. But great book. Practicing the presence of God, being aware of God's presence. This morning, I want us to turn to 2 Timothy for a moment, chapter 1. Uh, we're going to jump down and look at verse 7. And uh, uh, when you look in the mirror, what do you see? And when I looked in the mirror spiritually this morning, I saw myself as powerful, loving, and disciplined. And uh, some of those phrases are a little complicated, and some of them may not capture you as well as it captures others. It doesn't capture me all that well, to be honest with you. But that's something that Timothy was told by Paul. God has not given us a spirit of timidity. Some translations there say God has not given us the spirit of fear. Words are interchangeable. But of power and love and discipline. This past week, the illust opening illustration for this sermon happened, I guess it might have been Tuesday. Tuesday, came Tuesday, Pat came running into my office from the office across, and she said, there's a snake outside the office door. And I thought the snake was outside the office door, into the outside. No, it's on the inside in front of the office. And my response was, what do you want me to do about it? Well, Somebody ought to do something about it. And so she and I walked over, and we're both standing outside, and I'm looking at her, and she's looking at me. Now, you know, I don't have, I have a fear of snakes. I'm just going to be, I'll admit that. And, and there was a part of me that, that asked some very serious questions. How big of a snake? Well, it's only about that long, but that's too long for me. Is it a poisonous snake? I don't know. Well, if you don't know, I don't know either. Is it alive? Well, yes, it's alive. It was, it was crawling out from underneath the office door. And so one of us had to do something or she wasn't going to go back to work. And, and it was pretty obvious that she wasn't going back in the door. And it was pretty obvious that I was the only other person. So I came over to the kitchen and I got a pair of tongs. <laughs> I put them back. Don't worry. And I, I took the tongs over there, and I opened the door, and I looked, and I said, these are too short. And I walked back and, and put the tongs back in the office, and I thought, I said, there's got to be a way to get that snake out of here without me having to, to get too close to it. And I finally found a big, long stick thing, and I just kind of shifted him and scooted him until he got outside. And when he got outside, Pat ran back to this door over here, and the snake went one way, and I went the other way, and we've not seen each other since. However, there is a snake somewhere out there. And so I still, when I open the door, I kind of look to make sure that snake is not there. It kind of reminds me of a time when Grace Leitner let her snake loose in the church. I just saw you guys back there. Grace Leitner did a magic show at one of our talent things, and she was going to pull a snake out of a hat. And when she reached in there, the snake wasn't there. And Grace came to me and said, my snake is loose somewhere in the church. And I went out. I was gone. I, canceling services until the snake is found. And, and I told her, I said, Gracie Lightner, you find that snake. You know, I, you better find that snake. And fortunately, the snake was right up under the table there. But uh, she wanted to know if I wanted to see the snake. No, I don't want to see the snake. You know, just take the snake home. And if I'd known that you were bringing the snake, I wouldn't have let you in. But um, I don't, I'm, I have this fear of snakes, but God does not give us the spirit of fear or the spirit of timidity. Surely he was talking more than my fear of snakes and your fear of heights or your fear of whatever it might be. 
all of us have some kind of a fear that we have to face every now and then. But I believe Paul might be saying something a little bit more to Timothy. Timothy, in your ministry and in your walk with Christ, one thing that you should not have because God didn't give it to you, is a spirit of fear. And there's a couple of reasons why fear cannot dominate the Christian. First and foremost, when fear dominates a Christian, it hinders us from actually being used by God. <clears throat> How many times have we said no to God because we're afraid of what He's asked us to do? We have a fear of doing something. We have a fear of leaving the country. We have a fear of crossing a culture. We have a fear of dealing with somebody that may be sick. I often think about Mother Teresa who spent most of her life ministering to people with leprosy. And, and when asked why she put her life at risk like that, why was she in the community of, of lepers, she said, if I don't go, who is? Who else will go? I have to deal with my fear. I know that I'm, I live every day knowing that I could catch this contagious disease, but I, I have to overcome my fear. And did God use her? Yes. I like to look at, at teenagers when they go on mission projects and we say, we're going to climb up on this roof. And some little girl or some little boy says, not me. And all, all, we don't force them, but what we try to do is overcome your fear. Climb the ladder to this far. See if you can step out on the roof. See if, and, and eventually you find out that some of these kids not only have, don't have a fear of the roof, they enjoy the work that's being done. And when they get off, knowing that they've overcome their fear and that they've accomplished something, believes in their heart that God had used them to do something. Many times when, when Christians are captured by fear, we actually are hindered from being used by God. God would love to use us if we just weren't so afraid. Sometimes fear robs us of spiritual success. And, and when I think about that, I think about when we invest in something, you often want to have a successful return that comes back to you. And I'm not telling you, and please don't understand that, to, that I'm saying to you that if you do for God, God's going to reward you greatly. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that oftentimes we don't invest in spiritual things because we're afraid of the investment. And because we don't invest, we never see any spiritual successes. Now, let me, let me just bring that home to where that... that that hits the water. Very few of us invest in evangelism. Very few of us invest or make it a, a, a priority in our lives to take the gospel to people, but yet we want people to get saved. We want the spiritual blessings of people coming to know Christ. We want to be able to baptize people. We want to be able to, to do this, but very seldom do we ever invest in the evangelism that needs to take place in order to reach people. Paul said it this way, how are they going to hear if someone doesn't go? How are they going to go unless somebody sends them? See, you have to invest in it. Lost people aren't just going to wake up some morning and say, oh, I think I'm going to get saved today. Lost people don't wake up and say, hey, I heard the gospel today in my, in my sleep. I heard the God." No, the gospel is delivered by people who invest in that. The gospel is, is, is an investment that we make in the lives of people in hoping that there's going to be a spiritual return, okay? Oftentimes, we're robbed of that success because we're not willing to invest. Sometimes, fear causes us not to invest in the good. Sometimes, fear causes us to really not do good, period. We have the opportunity to do something good, but we choose not to to do it. Now, faith is the opposite of that. Faith cannot operate in the realm of fear. It's pretty simple. Jump. I'm afraid. How many little, ch how many preschoolers have come right here and they've, they've, you've seen them do it, haven't you? Now, there's a point in preschool where they have no fear. So there's a lot of preschoolers that will start running there, and they'll just run right off here. And if you're not careful, if somebody's not watching them, we catch them as they leap because they have no fear. But the first time they land hard, they understand fear. The first time you don't catch them, they understand fear. 
The last time I jumped off here, it hurt, and I ain't going to do it no more. And you can stand there and you can say, jump. You can say, I'll catch you. You can convince them that it's perfectly okay, but until they overcome their fear, they cannot exercise faith to jump off. And, and faith cannot operate in the realm of fear. So if you're going to be a person of faith, you can't be dominated by fear all the time. You have to understand that our God is a pretty big God and that when he calls us, there's a purpose behind it and he's asking us to invest in something guaranteeing us that he is backing the investment. Fear sometimes cuts off the blessings of faith. In other words, a lot of us are not receiving the presence of God in our lives. We're not understanding the blessings that flow because God is present in our lives simply because we're living our lives in some degree of fear. Prejudice is a fear. Oftentimes we have difficulty crossing over cultural barriers because we're afraid of the person on the other side. We don't go across the street because we're afraid of the person that's there. We don't go into certain neighborhoods because we have a fear there. And, and that fear keeps us from experiencing the blessings that God has for us. But what has God given to us? If fear is not what it is, then what has He given? What, what takes the place of fear in our lives? Paul says that we should possess three spirits. Not three Holy Spirits, three attitudes, three concepts. Concept number one, he says, but God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power. God has given us the spirit of power. Power should never in the Christian realm be associated with authority. Power should not be associated with privilege. Power should not be associated with the fact that we are better than or greater than someone else. However, we do have a sense of authority. Our authority is in the gospel. Our authority is in Jesus Christ. But our authority is not to hurt other people. Our authority is not to dominate other people. Our authority is not to push people into something. Our authority gives us the freedom and the sense of confidence that what we're doing is backed by our greatest investor, God himself. So if I am confident in my faith and I, I believe I have the power to do it, what should happen? Uh, I often think about people that are confident. Have you, ever, have you ever noticed somebody overconfident? You know, overconfidence is extremely dangerous. You know, I heard someone say, what, what's, the, what's the most common last words of an adult male? Watch this. <laughs> you know, have you, have you ever seen any of those, those cartoons where the guy's trying to paint a part of a stairwell and he's standing on top of a ladder that's got a stool that's got another stool that's leaning against something and underneath it it says this is why women live longer than men um, overconfident we sometimes are very overconfident here watch this and 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 we just feel like we we, we are we are super powered that that somewhere along the line we have been given some sense of a superpower at Disney a couple of weeks ago, we were all wanting to see Elsa. That was, that was Elsie's big thing. And uh, we were all excited that we were in line and that we were going to see Elsa. And that, that this frozen dream was about to become a reality for our granddaughter. And we were all with excitement and glee and, and all of that. And, and she went up and she, she talked to Elsa. And that was this wonderful experience. And then Elsa said, you know, make a wish. And she made the wish. And her wish was that she would have Elsa's superpowers. And she went outside and she wiggled her fingers like she was trying to make ice. And she said, I don't think it worked. God doesn't give us superpowers. It doesn't work that way. God doesn't say to us, you're a Christian, now you can stomp over all evil. No. If you think that you're because a Christian that you're going to overcome evil, you're sadly mistaken. The Bible tells me that I don't overcome evil, but the one who's inside of me overcomes evil. 
that I don't, I don't win that battle most often, that, that the one inside of me wins that battle. But we have this sense of overconfidence. And sometimes Christians get overconfident. And, and they, they, they literally say to the people around them, hey, watch this. And they think that God's going to back what they're doing. That's not the authority I'm talking about. The confidence that I'm talking about is the one that removes hesitation from me. The kind of confidence that I'm talking about is the kind of confidence that allows me to trust. I am confident in my God. I am confident that He is walking with me. I am confident that if I obey Him, that, that I will be where I'm supposed to be when I'm supposed to be there. Confidence does not allow us to recognize evil as being greater than our or equal than our God. Here are some things I'm confident about. I am confident that I have the authority that when God calls me, I can do whatever He calls me to do. I have absolutely no confidence that I can make you do anything. I've tried. It doesn't work. I have absolutely no confidence that I can change the world that's around me. I've tried. It's not that easy. I have no superpowers as a Christian. Now, often when I put on my academic robe, I say to you that when I do that, I become super preacher, and I'm able to read large Bibles in a single sitting, solve world problems. Oh, that's my imagination of being Superman sometimes. And do we not sometimes see overconfident Christians that think they're super Christians? That's not the kind of confidence. I am confident that if I move, God will move with me. I am confident that if I obey Him, that I can trust Him. I am confident that I am not going to be overwhelmed by evil or Satan because He is not on equal par with my God. We've all seen those little cartoons, two little boys arguing, and they, uh, they're, they're beginning to try to figure out how they're going to win this argument. And one of them says, my daddy's bigger than your daddy. And sometimes little boys get their daddies in some kind of thing saying, my daddy's bigger than your daddy. And then when the two daddies get together, they realize this ain't a good thing. The kind of confidence that I have does say to me, You can say to Satan that my daddy is bigger than you. And you can say that with a sense of confidence. You can say with a sense of confidence that evil does not win. You can say with a sense of confidence that evil has been destroyed. You can say with a sense of confidence that our sins can be forgiven and that Satan does not hold us bound unless we allow that to happen. I can say with a sense of confidence that God loves you and has died on a cross that you might be set free. I can say that with confidence. And that's my authority. That's my power. I've also given you, or God has also given you, a spirit or an attitude of love. In some other places, the Bible says perfect love Cast out what? Fear. So so when, when Paul says to Timothy, God didn't give you a spirit of fear, he replaced that with a spirit of love. The spirit of love overcomes fear. It casts it out. It drives it away. The things we love to do are the things that we're going to do the most. And Paul is reminding Timothy, if you love God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself, that's going to be the focus of your life. That's what you're going to invest in. That's what you're going to have. My spirit of love comes from the fact that I love God with all of my heart, mind, body, and soul, and I make an attempt every day to love my neighbor as myself. It has to become a passion for us that we love people not because we have to. I I sometimes say to this group down here, I love you only because God says I have to. You know, I love Preston because God says I have to, right? No, I love Preston for a lot more than that. 
We don't love people because God says we have to. We love people because it's what? Our passion to love people. Just think for a moment, if I were in that moment where that blonde-headed girl that so attracted me in college and realized that things were developing, and, and I said to her, I love you because God says I have to. I'm sure it would have ended well. What if you said to your wife, guys, I love you because God says I have to. And that's where the guys would say, I'll turn the other cheek because God says I have to. (laughs) It doesn't, it has no passion. But when I say to my wife, I love you with all of my heart, with all of my being, you're the most important thing in my life. That's passion. The kind of love that we're supposed to have as Christians are not love that says, I love you because I have to. I love you because it's expected of me. I love you because the Bible says, love your neighbor. You know, that is, that is so artificial and so false, and the world looks through it every day. But with you, when you with compassion and passion from within genuinely love, People see that. The former, the pastor that preceded me at First Baptist Church in Walterboro was named Posey Belcher. Posey was a, as an icon in that little town. He was one of those guys that just, that just demonstrated Christian love in so many different ways. But there's a little girl in that church that when I went there told the story of Posey. She said, when I became pregnant and was not married... My father was having a hard time. My mother was having a hard time. My family was having a hard time. And they were upstanding members of the church, and they were worried about how this was going to look. And, and the greatest fear was somebody had to tell Posey, the pastor. Integral part of the church. You can understand that, can't you? And she said, finally, my my father, in desperation, not knowing where else to turn, with anger, with uncertainty, with the confusion, went to Posey's office to get advice from the pastor. And he told him, my daughter's pregnant, not married. We We don't like this. And the little girl says that Posey listened to her father. And at the end of all that he regurgitated, he asked her at the end, do you love her? Well, of course I love her. And then Posey said, but then what's the problem? This little girl says, the first visitor I had was Posey Belcher. Who, when he knocked on my father's door because she was still living in her father's house, she went to the door and he had two packages of diapers, one under each arm. He said, I thought you might need these, and gave them to her and walked away. That's loving with passion. Did you hear me? That's loving with passion. That's the spirit of love that Christians should hold. The love that says this, I will love you, but, but automatically puts it in another category. I will love you if, if puts it in another category. I will love you, but you need to change. No. I will love you if you will do something for me. No, the Bible tells us that we should love with a sense of passion and compassion. The spirit that we as Christians have is not a judgmental love that loves with condition. It must be an unconditional love that loves with no conditions. 
Well, you got the spirit of power and you got the spirit of love, and really we can't have a good sermon unless we got three points. And so, Timothy, you also have the spirit of discipline. The word discipline there is a little misleading. The concept behind that word in the Greek is that you have peace. Discipline brings peace to your life. And this idea of peace is that it's not that that you can't have fear at the same time that you have peace. That that fear has to be resolved in order for there to be a peacefulness inside. And the peacefulness that we have inside allows us to operate without fear. I am at peace with myself. I am at peace with God. I have tried so desperately to be at peace with people that I have been separated from for whatever reason that may be. I strive for that. It's difficult. It's not easy. When, when there has been a conflict situation, it's never easy to build bridges back. And in a couple of weeks, I'm going to start a series of sermons on building bridges. <clears throat> and it's not, ever, it's not very easy sometimes to reconcile. It's not very easy sometimes to to cross over some of those places where you have been hurt before and you say to yourself, I'm not going to open that door again. But when you are at peace internally, when you're at peace with God, one of the things that it drives you to do is to be at peace with others. I'm going to tell a story and I haven't asked permission to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. We're, we're, we've nominated Preston Dowdy to be one of our deacons. And, and I'm excited about that. I think it's going to be one of the most cool things ever. We've never had a redheaded deacon. <laughs> you know, and and I, I, th- I think this is just, just wonderful. But there was a point, and Preston will know what I'm talking about. There was a point when he and I had a head-to-head. Didn't we, Preston? We had, we had a, I don't even call it a come to Jesus moment. It wasn't even good. And when Preston walked out the door, I said, we'll never see him again. Good. But when Preston walked back in the door, there was that moment where I was fearful, and I'm not exactly sure that you didn't understand some fear too. There was an uncertainty. There was something about that that said it's the right thing to do, but maybe it's not so good the right thing to do. But, but one of the things that happened is that I was at peace with it and you became at peace with it. And the peace that we resolved and the peace coming to peace with, the, with all of that has led us into a very meaningful relationship. Preston is on our family text. He even got to vote on the Christmas tree. And, and, and now that's, that's a big deal at my house, folks. We don't give, I have not given him the recipe to the turkey yet. <laughs> but maybe that'll happen one day, Preston. Maybe it'll happen. When I die, I've got it in my will. Give Preston the, 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 the recipe to the turkey. Here's what I'm saying. I'm, I am totally excited and thrilled that, de- that, that he is going to serve as a deacon at North River Baptist Church. And I am so at peace with that. Knowing that there was a moment when there wasn't such a peaceful relationship. Now, don't all of you run after church and ask what happened. It's not important. It means nothing. Because when you put those things behind you and you resolve those issues, it's a peacefulness that comes. We have been given the spirit of peace because we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. It is never the role of the Christian to be divisive. Never. Well, they're bad people, then love them. Point number two should come into play. Point number three is you should be disciplined enough to be at peace with that. Well, they're different, then love them and be at peace with that. 
Well, they don't think like we think. Then love them and be at peace with that. You don't have to agree. You don't have to be condoning. But you do have to love and be at peace with that. The most peaceful moment on the cross, in all of that turmoil, in all of that anguish, in the midst of all of that pain, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I think Jesus could have said to the Father, and by the way, I'm at peace with that. I'm okay with that. I'm okay that you forgive them, even though they have crucified me. Why? Because my passionate love for them. Understand that, folks. Paul was dead center right on target. You're not given the spirit of fear. And fear often causes us to do stupid things. But he has given you a sense of authority and confidence, power. He's also given you a perfect love that's uncompromising and that it's a passion that you have inside. And he's also given you a discipline that allows you to be at peace, even in the midst of conflictual situations. Well, do you have three out of three? Maybe two and a half out of three? Maybe two out of three? Maybe one out of three? Or is it possible that you're still dominated by the spirit of fear? If fear dominates our life, it's very difficult to have those other three. But when you put fear aside, you let God remove the fear and you replace it with faith, then you have power. And you have passionate love. And you have discipline that brings about peace. Father, forgive us when we have lived our lives in such fear. Father, forgive us when our fear has caused us not to be used by you and fear has been has what's caused us not to invest in the lives of others, and fear has been what has driven us into arguments, and we're just asking your forgiveness for our fear. But we pray earnestly today that you would fill us with this power, this love, this discipline, this peacefulness that dictates who we are in our relationship to others. And we pray, Father, that we would have the discipline to work on those every day. For we pray it in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen.